Okay, um, so I am a Duke and I, I come over from Escalante. Um, and uh, okay, to orient you to the uh, where the Escalante River watershed is, um, as you can see here on this map. Um, so, uh, as you can see here on this map, the Escalante River watershed is located here in uh, south central Utah. Um, here is the community of Escalante, and this is the community of Boulder. Um, the headwaters for the Escalante River watershed uh, begin up here on the Aquarius Plateau on the U.S. Forest. Um, from there, the river uh, runs 90 miles through Grand Circus Escalante National Mon Monument. And then through Glen Canyon National Recreation Area, where it discharges into Lake Powell. Um, my first experience with the uh, the Escalante River was approximately, uh, well, actually, it was over 15 years ago. I worked with a couple of uh, NRCS soil scientists, and one day they invited me to go out into the field with them to help them dig their soil kit. Um, on that particular day, we hiked one of the overlooks of the of one of the main side tributaries of the Yukon River, and um, overseeing this one particular canyon, I just it was one of those moments for me where I felt that I definitely needed to return to this place. It, was, it just kind of struck me at the core. Um, so not only did I return, I I landed a position with the Grand Staircase and I moved to Yukon, uh, which for me was very exciting and I'm very happy to be there. <coughs> So, in this photo, you can see, um, I wanted to show a photo of both Esquan and Boulder, but I only have a photo of Esquan in the river. <laughs> um, the Esquan Valley was settled by the Mormon pioneers in 1875, and the town of Boulder was settled in 1889. Um, these two valleys provided the, uh, the settlers, were, or these two valleys provided uh, what was needed for the settlers at the time a mild climate. Uh, winter and summer range for their um, cattle and sheep. Um, the pioneers talked excitedly about how grass was um, as tall as the horse's knee. Um, these valleys gave places for livestock to range along the Esquan River and its uplands, and uh, during the winter months on uh, Boulder Mountain during the summer range. Um, still to this day, in the lower uh, sections of the tributary and along the side canyons, um, you can find line shacks and cabins. One of the first orders of business when the settlers came into the area was to build canals and ditches for irrigation water. Before wells were dug, culinary water was bucketed out from the Esquan River to the individual towns. It wasn't until 1936 that the Esquan, uh, the town of Esquan, had access to pipes drinking water. Um, water was piped 18 miles uh, from the springs located in uh, Pine Creek Canyon. It was also this, uh, this piping also allowed for the first indoor plumbing within the community of Esquan. Um, the site tributaries are um, a vital source for drinking water and irrigation for for both of these communities. There are currently uh, three irrigation companies within the watershed. Two of them are located within Esquan, and, uh, and, and the third one is located in uh, Boulder. So during the early days of the Esquan settlement, uh, there were no dance halls, so members of the community met along the banks of the river and dance in the sand. Today, the Esquan River continues to provide outstanding opportunities for recreation, such as hiking, engineering, bird watching, photography, and camping. Research on the river's natural history shows there were major flood events during 1929 to 1932, wiping out the majority of the vegetation. Uh, you can see in this photo here uh, that was um, taken for the National Geographic uh, September of 1949 issue. You can see pretty much the Esquilani River down here is, is denuded of all vegetation except for a couple of these cottonwood trees. In the late 1930s through the 1950s, the Esquilani River went through a period of extreme variability um, with drought conditions and then major flooding. It wasn't until the 1960s that vegetation um, came to ground again along the river. 
I would say that in this photo, which was taken during the 1970s, which is one of our real archive photos, you can see the river here is, uh, has the braiding that is, um, I think it's a good thing, I'm not a hydrologist, but I hear the braiding in the river system is a good thing. <laughs> um, but you can also see the native vegetation in here. Um, it actually looks pretty decent for, for the 1970s. <laughs> Um, in this photo here, which was taken in 1978, um, both native and non-native vegetation have stabilized the banks of the river, and doesn't quite allow the flooding to a gower up canyon like it has in the past. Um, this photo over here, um, we did a demonstration project in 2010 where we removed fresh mold and cameras from the upstream side of the Iowa 12 bridge, which is right here. Um, now, which what is, what is located in or the plants that occupy that area now is mostly uh, cottonwoods and willows. We even found a couple of goodies willows, which were hidden in the in the mountains and brush off the cameras. You look uh, further downstream, you can see the silver lining. This is kind of our corporate that we're going after from the watershed. Okay. So once I started working in Escalani, I was contacted by an individual named Bill Wolverton, who was more or less the one who started this crazy project. Um, he's an individual who's dedicated to this, and I would say is a little bit obsessed with Russian oil and renewable. Um, I didn't know really any of this when I moved to the area, um, and he, he invited me to join him on one of his volunteer trips further down in the Glen Canyon area and he's a backcountry ranger uh, for Glen Canyon. And so I went for a full five days of some, some of the most intense manual labor that I'd ever participated uh, on in my entire life. It was gruesome. And I thought for sure he was crazy. Um, after that, Bill, uh, for lack of the word, mad me to start a program like this on Grand Staircase. And Kind of hands and hog for three years. Um, but then I eventually found some funding and uh, worked with the wilderness volunteers to uh, start a project in 2006. And, and I guess that's history. <laughs> Everything else is history now. <clears throat> anyway, um, um, <clears throat> during the spring of uh, 2009, I began to receive um, email messages from Linda Whitem, which is the Nature Conservancy, and some messages uh, just from John Spence, who is the park ecologist for Glen Canyon. Um, they were kind of inquiring about this desire to start a watershed partnership for the Escalon River. Um, I thought this idea was excellent um, because the rate I was going, I didn't think I would ever see the final product for this project. Um, with the formation of, of the ERWP, um, an outline for this particular project came into fruition with the development of our two-year action plan. Um, this is one of many plans that we have um, lined up in our action plan. Specific to Russian oil control, the Woody and Basic Control Plan was developed, which um, is a moving document and more or less exposed me to the amount of work that still lies ahead of us, even though we've been working on this project for a good 12, 13 years. Um, and another great aspect about the development of the partnership is now there's a way for um, private landowners to get involved with this project. And pretty much all of the private lands sit above Grand Staircase and Glen Canyon, and, and uh, they contain some of the largest infestation sites. So I've always known that as long as the population exists in that part of the river, we're going to continue to have problems further down the street. Um, we were also able to invite uh, U.S. National uh, U.S. Forest Service, the National Forest, to the table. With the elevation that they're at, they don't have a whole lot of uh, living species, but um, what they do have is, is still in have to continue to feed a supply of seeds for for us further downstream. So uh, hopefully, we'll be able to eradicate those populations above us. Um, in this map, I wanted to uh, show you what has been completed to date. Um, everything here that um, in the red has been completed. Um, we have just just along the river, just the river itself. We have over half of the river treated. Um, the stuff that's indicated in green is, is the stuff we still have to work on. 
And this looks like a lot of work, and it is a lot of work, but um, there's still some, we're still doing some inventory work, um, which I think will reduce some of the work that I've um, for instance, here um, we have this section. This is the Alvin Wash um, tributaries to the Esquimalt River. And in the past fall, we, we brought in a crew from Utah State University to inventory this section of Alvin Wash. It's a pretty large side tributary. Um, and they inventory for all the invasive species, and they also inventory for the herbaceous species. Uh, fortunately, plants such as Russian yapping and corn crabs were not found in this inventory. What we did find in the nearly 5,000 acres, um, about 150 of the acres are infested by Russian olive, and about 200 by tamarind. So the population level is pretty low, and it's a huge relief for people like me. Um, where Abbey Wash turns and runs through the community of F1 on down through Terrace Wash. Um, it's a pretty solid uh, ribbon of, of Russian olive and tamarind um, that run all the way through there. Uh, but a lot of these little side canyons here are um, dry washes or general washes. And the majority of those sites, um, from my hiking experience, really don't contain a whole lot of Russian olive or tamarind. So uh, I think our, I think in this area our biggest workload will be right along how we wash. Um, as far as the Esalen River, um, we are trying to close the gap between Harris Wash and Del Hollow. Um, our largest infestation site along the river itself is between here at Del Hollow and Boulder Creek. And again here at the Bunny Hanging Ground to line down to Harris Wash. Um, those areas are, are heaviest infestation. And then the space between Glen Canyon and Boulder Creek, uh, for some funny reason, the infestation might be about <coughs> so in this slide, um, this is a this is our work site or our project for 2013 to get all of our funding. Um, as you can see we have some, some project sites here on the State National Forest. Um, about for Boulder and Esquimalt. We have some uh, work on private land in the town of Boulder and Esquimalt. Uh, here in Death Hollow, Sand Creek, Boulder Creek on um, Grand Staircase. And we also have this work site down here uh, about the first wash on Boulder um, I mentioned earlier that the partnership um, developed a 10 year action plan and a Woody and Baby Control Plan. This is the um, cover for the Woody and Baby Control Plan. Um, the partnership also has some smaller committee groups and has developed uh, this uh, um, professional removal guide and then also our restoration guide. <coughs> the restoration guide gives information to private landowners as well as land managers on choosing appropriate materials for a specific site. It also assists with developing goals for each site and uh, what may be needed for a private land owner. Uh, their end goals may be different from what like our end goals are for uh, public land managers. Um, the cutting guide for Russian olive gives directions on the best path. You think that it wouldn't be a difficult process, but um, we found that if we don't follow these time tested suggestions, um, you have this free growth nightmare, whether it be Russian olive or any um, would be invasive species. <coughs> then uh, this, this uh, guide here has kind of been our, our Bible for the working with the conservation board. Um, we're able to give this out to all of the crew members and it gives them the same information and it shows them to the same concept so that they're doing um, pretty much what we ask them to do at each site and it doesn't matter which core we come from. Um, we have just the consistency of work throughout the park or throughout the watershed. <coughs> Uh, one one uh, monitoring, I, I forgot to put on here, a monitoring guide, but we do have that that um, gives guidance on uh, monitoring our vegetation, geomorphology, hydrology, and our wildlife. Um, and in this last meeting, we, we started the discussion about having a, a short term monitoring plan. <coughs> you know, with regards to our workforce, um, 
BRWP works with the four different conservation corps from Utah and Arizona. Um, we also work with a few volunteers, um, primarily wilderness volunteers. And I have to put in a plug for the wilderness volunteers because they consistently worked with us like since the beginning of this project, um, back in 2000 with Bill Overton. They generally only provide one trip per agency per year. Um, but in this case, they provide both Point Canyon and Grand Cherokee, each with two two projects, uh, two times a year. Um, <clears throat> so if you feel so inclined, you can go to wildernessvolunteers.org and sign up for a unfilled view of work along the Point River if you want. Fun! <laughs> um, <clears throat> for the conservation course last year, uh, we provided a uh, week long training for all of the core members. Um, the crews were able to hit the ground running and they were uh, pros. You could say they were pros before the project even started. Um, they knew what needed to happen. And Christina Wagner, who's the ERWP field coordinator myself, were both very impressed with the quality of work um, that was generally taking about three weeks um, otherwise if they did not have this training. So we're definitely planning on doing this again. August, and uh, before we begin our project in September. <coughs> um, a little note on restoration, and I'm, in this situation I'm going to speak just kind of on my experience uh, working on public land specific to Grand Staircase. Um, I worked with the uh, Colorado Plateau Native Plant Development Program and also with the Season Success Program. And myself and some of my interns have gone out and collected the uh, from the Osceola River watershed and sent them off to the Bend Phoenix Factory. They take a certain amount of seeds for posterity um, or for uh, research needs, and then the remaining amount that they don't need, they send back to me. And then I take that along with uh, materials such as below pole cutting and cottonwood pole cutting, and I worked with a wildland nursery in Joseph Yusuf, Utah, to grow these species out and then we plant them back out um, in areas that we have treated. Um, sometimes it's about a two-year process before we can get these plants um, big enough or small enough <laughs> uh, to go back into these sites. I wanted to point out in this photo here, I worked with the conservation corps last summer, uh, or actually the last fall, and uh, took them off of their chainsaws and planted them back. It was just right under five years plant on that. Day. So, I kind of feel like this is like the more important side of, of the project. Um, so, I, I'm not sure if I mentioned it earlier, but uh, so this, 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 this whole process here, we call it you know, active restoration. And um, what I wanted also to show is some of our passive restoration uh, sites, because most of the project sites along the Esalen River. Um, are, are in pretty decent condition. I took both of these photos on the same day, just for, you know, this was before we started work in the morning and this was after the project uh, ended at the end of the day. And as you can see, there's a fair amount of state of vegetation in there. Um, give it give it uh, three to six months in the growing season and we're going to lose that quite a bounce back to the native vegetation. We do have a couple of these fresh metal trees here that we uh, left standing but we did grow them. And then on this slide, um, again, this is down by the Highway 12 bridge, the uh, upstream side. Um, again, just to demonstrate the cost of restoration that occurs here, um, I took this photo before the project started in the fall of 2010, and this was just June, the following summer. So it hadn't even been a full year. So we, I feel that we're pretty lucky um, within the Esalen River watershed that we don't have secondary weed infestation such as fresh and happy and hoary crust. Um, we have the uh, pretty, pretty diverse and uh, great native system that's still pretty much intact. Um, just to kind of touch briefly on the Tamaris leaf beetles, I came across this site in 2008. It was my first sighting of uh, Tamaris leaf beetles on the Esalen River. Not to say they weren't somewhere else, it's just the first time I had observed them. Um, I went back last fall to the same site and we took this photo. You can see here that the Tamaris is still alive, but it's struggling. And, and then we also have 
uh, for the native vegetation that's growing in around it. Um, this is kind of one of those sun-baked areas that uh, rabbit and then uh, last but far from me, um, the ERWC was nominated to represent Utah BLM at the Department of the Interior River Initiative Conference in April of 2012. Um, under the America's Great Outdoors um, umbrella, this initiative highlights partnerships and projects such as ours to provide insight and guidance to other projects. Um, or potential projects that other people in different communities are, are wanting to start. Um, I was the one that went to Washington D. last year, and I have to say it was a great honor to be recognized by the Secretary, and I'm really excited that um, we were again nominated for 2013. Um, so I'm proud of our partnership. <laughs> um, and that was pretty much my last slide. I, I realized I forgot to list all of my partners. Um, so I'll just kind of name off a few in that we have, uh, uh, of course, all of the federal land agencies, the Park Service, BLM, and the Forest Service. Um, we've been working very closely with the Tamworth Coalition and the, um, the Nature Conservancy. Um, Older Community Alliance has been pretty, uh, 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 they've been, they've been our connection with the private land owners in both uh, Boulder and Wyoming. That's just a few. We have over 30 partners within our partnership. If anyone has questions, at any time. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Why do you think that Russian all got established anyway? Should have been flood in the 40s? If it's a healthy river system? Right. Um, we actually have a little uh, project going on right now with, with uh, Mike Scott with USGS. He's gone in and he's collected some um, chunks of wood, I guess you could say, from the Russian olive tree. Because the, the Russian olive did come in and kind of all at once the same time. Using at the same time, we think. Um, so we're hoping that this uh, little study that Frank Scott is going to do will kind of help us answer that question as to why, what triggered this infestation because it wasn't until the 80s that the personnel really noticed along that Hawaiian River. Um, but it had been in the area for a number of years. I don't really know, I'm sorry, I don't have a direct answer to the question. <laughs> One more. Any? Thanks. I was curious what your crew did with the biomass put on Slash. I hate that question. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then the Woody and Baker Control Plan, we have a, we have a chapter just on Woody to Woody Debris Control. Um, uh, what we've had to do is, in some places, uh, around the Death Hollow area where it was, it was very, uh, the infestation levels were pretty high, we, we blocked out areas, um, I think they were 100 or 300 meter sections, and we treated every other section, um, and we created uh, what we call stream bank piles, and these, these are piles that we put within the river system, like up against the side of the wall, we're not trying to block the river from flowing, but the, because the pieces are very small, and those are intentionally meant to go downstream um, with flash floods. Um, we have upland bank piles, uh, which uh, we don't have the authority at this particular point in time to, to burn, uh, but if they are still there, and we, and we have that permission or authority or whatever, too, we'll go back in and do some burning. Um, another way that we do debris control is we girdle the trees and keep them standing. But we, we you got to keep it in mind that you know you don't want to have a standing forest of dead trees, so kind of have to pick and choose. A lot of times we save um, girdling for trees that are straight and upright, something that's laying parallel close to the ground. In the way that will just we'll have a free breath. So we kind of have to do a combination of oh, the other the other things here in a low infestation area. We create these piles, what we call wildlife habitat piles. Because we found that when you when you make these piles, the little critters seem to really like them. It gives them some cover to hang out, and so 
but definitely a very light conversation here. Thank you very much.